So we are on titles, uh, week number three. If you weren't here for the first two weeks, uh, we covered being a child uh, and also being a boyfriend and a girlfriend. The gist of the series is uh, the titles that we hold throughout our life. No one really gives us a, an intro to it. No one gives us a manual. Everything that we do, it, we just kind of learn as we go along. So this week, um, it's a little bit out of order, okay, well, for most people. But now we're going to uh, talk on the subject of parenting, okay? So we're going to talk on the subject of uh, husband and wife, but um, I will be gone for the rest of the weekend up with our, uh, some of the seniors from our Joshua team on our senior retreat. And so I will be out of town, and so that's why we are doing this uh, via video. Uh, but it's a topic that I'm passionate enough about that I wanted to make sure that I was able um, to deliver it because it just gets my, you know, my heart pumping. I love this topic. I love talking about this stuff. And um, so, yeah, if you are there Saturday night and or Sunday morning, um, we miss you. If you want to join Joshua Team, you should, especially if you're a junior, because then next year you can go on this with us. Um, but, yeah, so that's the gist of what we're going to cover today. So if you're going to need your Bibles for this. Uh, if you don't have those, then someone hopefully at this point is now going to go get you one. But, uh, yeah, you don't have to because everyone here has a Bible. So um, we are going to talk about parenting. And here's the natural reaction. I think here's the knee-jerk reaction that we get to when you go, hey, we're talking about parenting. Everyone in this room, as far as I know, is like, I don't, I don't need that. I am not a parent. And so it's really easy for us to pass that assimilation on to somebody else. Go, okay, I'm not a parent yet. I don't need to do that. Well, I think what any successful parent would tell you is that their parenting started before they ever had kids. It's a mindset that you walk into with it. And here's how I, what I liken it to. Um, my brain, uh, I have a very, like, I love using terminology from, like, psychology. I love using terminology from sociology. Um, I love learning about argument styles, about redactive rhetoric. I love learning about all that other kind of stuff. And what I realized is, and some of you will do this in college, is you, you grow up with people and you kind of understand the way that they work. But when you take a psychology class, all of a sudden you can put verbiage to what they're doing or what they're not doing or why it's working and why it's not working. For instance, a good example of that is, uh, how many of you guys drive? You guys are driving, almost everyone in here is driving. Okay, so here's the thing. Before you drove, you're not super aware of things that drivers are aware of, right? If I asked you what's the speed limit in a residential area, almost all of you would say 25 miles an hour. <laughs> Those who say 45 do have a ticket, okay? 25 mile an hour. And then if I said, uh, ask you questions about the bike lane or what certain things mean or how to parallel park or whatever it might be, what speed limits are on certain streets, even directions to places, instead of going, oh, it's by Chick-fil-A, you could start telling me, okay, well, you go down Oceanside Boulevard and you take a right on Marin. So you, you, you're able to give more verbiage to stuff. Now, before, you may have understood, you had a, a brief understanding of what it was, but once you get verbiage to it, then everything becomes a little more illuminating. So what, what you, some of you will do is you'll take a psychology class and you'll learn about like autism or you'll learn about um, some other kind of psychological disorder, where, uh, whether it be like egocentrism or codependency or social anxiety. But then you start, you label everyone, right? You get verbiage for it, you get a name for it, and then the people that you've dealt with your whole life, you look at your mom one day and you're like, you're narcissistic. And they're like, what? And you're like, I... My whole life, I've known you, but I never knew what to call it. You are narcissistic. Like you only think about yourself. And they're like, what are you talking about? And so it just gives you kind of a platform to jump off. And that's what we're talking about with parenting. Some of you, you've seen good parents. You've seen lousy parents. Everyone's been in Walmart where there's the lady that's dragging her kid, and he's screaming, and he's cussing, and it's like, that is just not going to end well. Okay? So in this message, it's how do we hold this title well? How do we get that verbiage so we can start becoming aware of parents around us, of our parents, of the way that we see other people parent, and go, you know what, I'm going to bring that with me, I'm going to let that go. I'm going to hold on to that principle, I'm going to let that principle go. And once we have those in our back pocket, that will illuminate us to the world of parenting, which will make us ultimately better parents. Okay? So more than anything, this is a, an introduction to the verbiage of parenting, so that as you carry on these next 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 20 years before you have kids, that you will then begin to uh, have that dialogue internally, okay? It's a lot of uh, premise for this, but that's what it is. So our main sections tonight are, we're going to do the stages of parenting, the act of parenting, and the goals of parenting, 
Okay, the stages of parenting, the act of parenting, and the goals of parenting. Okay, so we will begin with the stages of parenting. Now, one of the main mistakes that people are going to make in the parenting is that they mix up these things that we uh, would consider stages. Now, uh, from Dobson to Hayford to, I actually got this list from uh, Dave Enns, who's a growth group pastor here at, at North Coast Church, um, father of Landon Enns. Um, please don't raise your hand. You're very, being very distracting. So he gave me this list, and he said, basically what happens is as you grow up, your relationship with your kids takes on different uh, premises. For instance, he said the first stage is commander. The first thing you are is a commander. Okay? As a parent, the first thing you do is you command. What does command look like? Look like don't touch that. Get away from there. Okay? And a lot of times as commander, it's not even verbal, especially when they're very, very young and they don't understand it or they practice egocentrism, which is something that babies do. Okay? They have the concrete rational thinking where they think the whole world revolves around them. So when you say do or don't, they don't understand it. They just think that you are revoking their will from them, so they get upset. Okay, so sometimes commanding looks like, I'm going to move you away from the lion. And sometimes it's saying, don't go near the lion, okay? That's a commander, okay? Probably up until you're about seven years of age, that first seven-year period is much more commander. Do this, don't do that, and there's a discipline that goes along with that. After commander is coach, okay? So uh, commander, their orientation is futuristic, but it's like three-second futuristic, Okay, very rarely do you talk to a three-year-old about uh, delayed gratification, right? They don't understand that concept. You don't talk to a kid like, listen, you can either eat a handful of M&Ms now or have high cholesterol when you're older. You choose. Kids like, <laughs> I choose the M&Ms, clearly. Okay, they don't understand that. They, again, it's that concrete, rational thinking where everything is in the here and now, so they don't get that. So the commander says, in the next three seconds, this is what your job is. I'm going to tell you what to not do. Don't do that. No more that. Don't walk near the stairs. Okay, but it's very here. It's very now, and if it's the future, it's the next three or four seconds. The next thing is coach. Coach becomes future-oriented. Okay, so a coach isn't necessarily walking around. If you've ever had a coach in basketball or football or anything else like that, um, Sometimes they're going to, they bring commander aspects in like, hey, don't talk to your teammates that way. But much more what a coach is going to do is he's going to talk to everyone. He's going to go, hey, we're a team. Okay, it's a little bit more metaphysical. It's not so do this, don't do this, don't touch that. It's much more, hey, let's, I saw what happened there. Let's talk about what happened. Let's talk about how we can fix that. Okay, about 5 to 12 years old is where this is going to get, get into that range. Okay, again, because some kids are going to be younger, some are going to be older. So commander might be a little bit later, might be a little bit earlier. Okay, so that coach is going to be, if you think about a, a basketball coach or football coach, that's the best way to think about it, okay? They're not on the field with you every single second. No, 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 block, block, block. But after the play, they pull you to the side and they go, listen, let's talk about how that happened. Let's talk about why that happened. Let's talk about what we can do to fix it in the future. Coach. So number three is counselor, Okay. So commander deals in the right now, deals in the next three seconds. Coach is future-oriented, okay, days, weeks, months even sometimes, going, hey, how can we have fixed that going forward? You fought with your friend. What can you do tomorrow at school in order to change that? Okay, counselor is much more present-oriented, okay? And it's much less about actions and much more about emotions. At this time, if you've done your diligence with being both commander and coach, you should have given yourself the freedom to now be counselor, which is instead of going, you need to do this, you can't do that, you're going, hey, how did that make you feel? What was your response to that? Why did you feel that way? How can I help in this kind of thing? You become a counselor for them, a sounding board, okay? Commander, coach, counselor, and finally consultant, okay? So counselor can even give you those life steps, right? Okay, well, here's what I think you should do. Uh, you should make sure you do A, B, and C, and that's going to lead to X, Y, and Z. Well, a consultant isn't really like that. A consultant, a consultant is much more, their main job is to listen to you and then give advice based on what they've been through. Okay, some people would call this phase the friendship phase. Okay, which basically means is the way that you deal with your friends right now. You interact, you listen to them, they listen to you, you have a good conversation, you become a consultant for them. As a parent, you become a consultant. 
Okay, so you're not involved in the everyday. You're not in the present necessarily as much. You're in the future, but you're future metaphysically orientated. So your kids coming up going, hey, I don't know if we're ready for kids. What do you think? When were you ready for kids? And they go, oh, let me tell you about the time that we started having kids. That's a consultant. Okay, at the end of a consultant's uh, day, they don't ever go, now do this and don't do that. They go, here's what I would do. Here's my experience. Take what you want, leave what you want. Okay. One of the main problems that we have in parenting, not we as if I've done any kind of parenting up until now, um, but basically what, where all this stuff comes from is just, uh, I'm a nerd at my core, and some of you guys know that about me, but it's taking, I have this fatuation with taking a bunch of books on different topics and then having the big points boiled down into one. Okay, I'm, I'm, I want to save you time and money. I want to read all the books on leadership and funnel into one thing and go, here are the five basic principles. Everything about love and file into five things. Everything about relationships, five different things. Everything about parenting, five different things. So that's where all this comes from. Okay? So when they get mixed up, that's why we have problems with kids. That's the number one reason we have problems with kids, because we get those things mixed up. Okay? You want to be friends with your 12-year-old. You want to play consultant with a 12-year-old, that's where you get messed up. Okay, like I said, that last, phase, that last phase of consultant becomes friend. Okay, You should never be friends with a, a junior higher, ever, as a parent. Okay? It's just not going to work out. Okay, Your job is not that as a parent. So sometimes they go, oh, well, I wasn't a very good commander and a coach, so now when it's time to be counselor, they're 13 to 17 and 18 years old or whatever it might be. They go, okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be commander to catch up. It's way too late way too late. You can't do that. When he has lived his whole life on his own accord, doing his own thing, his own way, he's got his keys and you walk in trying to be commander, the instinct that he's going to have is rebellion. It's forget you. Forget you. Some of you guys have parents like that. Or you have a, a dad or mom who is absent, show up in your life and they're like, now I'm going to play the part of your mom. And you're like, since when? Okay? So these things are in order. Commander, coach, counselor, consultant. Don't get them confused. Okay, and then when you see people who are stunted in their growth, it's because they should be consultation, should they should be in the consultant phase, and they're still being commanded. Okay, so you get these like 40-year-olds who internally are 12 years old because their moms never let their mom or dad never let them uh, graduate from that commander phase. Okay, so uh, we're going to have goals of parenting and then active parenting. So I did those backwards. So what are the goals of parenting? Okay, the number one thing, uh, actually I actually learned this from my mother-in-law, and I thought this was a really sweet way to put it, is um, we raise our kids to be adults, not kids. It's a really, it's kind of a weird way of thinking about it, right? My goal should never be to have my kid be an incredible 12-year-old. It should be to be an adult. We, we don't raise our kids to be their age. We raise them to be what we want them to be as adults. Now, that doesn't mean that a 12-year-old can't play in the mud and wrestle with his friends or anything else like that, but the way that he interacts with people, okay, to perpetuate it at a young age is to perpetuate it as an, at an older age. Okay, Andy Stanley has this great quote uh, for parenting, and it's, um, later is longer. Okay, later is longer. And what that basically means is as a parent, sometimes you don't want to discipline, you don't want to do certain things right now. But if you do those things right now, then later they will be adults. Later you'll have a healthy relationship, and later is much longer than right now. It's really gratification, Okay. So if you parent well now, then later you can reap the benefits of it. Rather than the, the adverse is, I want to be their friend now, but then later you have an unhealthy relationship. Okay. A healthy adult relationship is the number one goal of parenting. The, the, with you, they want to have a healthy adult relationship with you, with one another. And here's where people really get messed up. And you guys in your schools, you've met people who don't have social awareness. The way that they talk about people, the way that they interact puts them in a place where they ostracize themselves. And a lot of times it's because in, in the world of parenting, there wasn't due diligence with them becoming adults. Okay? And so if they were treated way too much like kids when they were a kid and they can consistently maintain that mentality, then they don't know how to interact in healthy adult relationships. Okay? Um, goal parenting should, you should want, as far as your kids are concerned, you should want them to want to be with you. You should parent in such a way with integrity that when they get older, your kids want to want to be with you. Okay? 
And third goal of parenting, and this is for us as Christians, is that they should be accountable to God. Okay? Third goal of parenting is not only they're accountable to you, they have healthy adult relationships with one another, but they want to be with you. It's not just healthy, but they desire to be with you. And lastly, is they feel accountable to God. And the way that they raise their families, and the way they interact, the way that they talk, the way that they have their relationships, that they are accountable also to God. They have that healthier fear, fear of Him. Okay, Chris Brown says that his goal for his kids is that when they turn 18, they will love Jesus, they will love the church, and they will love Him and his, and his wife. He's like, those are my three goals, that they love Jesus, the church, and me. And so that means sometimes when the church asks for extra overtime with Chris Brown, Chris Brown says no. Because he knows that later on, and later is longer, that the kids are going to go, oh, North Coast Church is the church that took my dad away from me. I hate North Coast Church. Okay? Or they might actually impose that on God himself. Okay? In which case, if you impose that on God himself, then they look at God as that. God is the man who took my dad away from me. So he goes, when they turn 18, I want them to love God, to love the church, and to love me and my wife. So those are the goals. Healthy adult relationships. Want them to want to be with me and accountable to God. And the act of parenting. This one's the most fun. The act of parenting. Okay? It's the methodology behind why we parent. The, the pedagogy, if you will. Okay? Why do we do what we do? And here's something that a lot of you will slip into the same thing as me, uh, and that is we want to treat children... Um, that's the way that my brain works. I want to treat them almost like an assembly line. Like, ooh, I saw what you did. I know exactly what to do, and I piece all the information there. Okay, I saw what you did. I'm going to put everything there, and it's always going to work out. Okay, so it's always good, even when you're hearing these methodologies and, and all these different ways of thinking, is uh, they're human at the end of the day, which means they all have different personalities, right? You've all been with kids before, and you walk up to one kid and push him over and go, you moron, and he's like, ha! Ah! And he laughs, and he starts like jumping on your leg, and you push him over again, and you're like, uh, eat dirt. And he's like, no, 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 I'm not going to eat dirt. Oh. Okay, and you need another kid, and you push him over, and you're like, eat dirt. And he's like, I hate you. And he like cries to his mom and dad. Okay, so everyone's different. Even in the same family, okay, they can be very, very different. All right? Like, when I was a little kid, if I hit Colby, he would hit me back. But if Colby ever hit me, I went and told my mom. Okay? <laughs> and then even the way my parents would deal with me was very different the way they would deal with Colby. But, as a whole, the act of parenting. Um, and so, again, this is, what if you boil down all those big parenting books by Dobson and Hayford and Stanley, and, and you said, what's going to rise to the top? You put them all in a pot and you boil it down, and what are you going to scoop off the top in your little ladle of truth? These are the things that kind of pervaded above all else. And I boil it down into one sentence. Here you go. Here's parenting in one sentence. Clear expectations met with consistent consequences through discipline, discipline. Clear expectations met with consistent consequence through disciplined discipline. Clear expectations met with consistent consequences through disciplined discipline. So we'll walk through each phase of that, and that's just how we're going to finish out our time today. Number one, okay, so on that thing, parse out all these different things, okay? So write the word clear underneath that in your notes. Clear, what does clear mean? Okay, it's important. You can't just throw that word out there as if everyone understands. Clear means this, okay? The kid knows what is right and wrong, always. Okay? It's irresponsible to discipline, even discipline discipline, if the kid does not know that what he's doing is wrong. If a kid knows what he's doing is wrong, he sees punishment as a reaction to what he did wrong. If he doesn't know what he did wrong, he sees it from you as uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be that way. Does it make sense? He sees it as anger. He can take it as anger or uh, he didn't deserve it. And that can stir up all these different things for him emotionally. Okay. So uh, how many of you guys had parents that were spankers? You had spanking parents. Wow. Wow, <laughs> every one but like two had spanking parents. My parents were spanking parents. And so the way that my dad always taught me with this is, I remember from a very early age, um, I was the kid who my mom would go, hey, listen, you can ride your bike, but don't go into our neighbor's yard, right? 
So in Oklahoma, you have your driveway, and they're all like this on a steep thing because everyone has like three-story houses because you can build them high in, in Oklahoma, and they won't fall over because of uh, there's no like uh, ground-shaking things. What are those called? Earthquakes. There's no earthquakes. And so she, my dad used to go, and he would spray paint the sidewalk as far as I could go. And there's like video of me, and I would be on the sidewalk, and if it was sprayed right here, and this was the neighbors, I would dangle my foot over like this while staring at my dad like, I'm not over it. I'm not over the line. I'm not going to I'm not there. You can't punish me. Okay, but that's the kind of kid that I was. So my, what my dad would say is he would go, you may absolutely, you can balance all day. If your foot or any part of your body touches over that line, you will get a spanking. And so it was never unclear to me. I was never like, do I, does this time I get one? Or what, what about my foot? What about if I, if I lean? He was very clear. You can lean all you want. You know, if, if that brings you joy, lean your little self to death. <laughs> but if any part of you touches that other side, you will get a spanking. And then I would touch the other side, and my dad would go, oh, no. You get a spanking. And always, consistently. Okay, clear expectations. Some things that are always wrong. So under clear, this is a really great way to, to remember it. Okay, this is from Hayford. Three things that are always, always wrong in your family. Okay, your commandments, if you will. Three Ds. Disobedience, dishonesty, and disrespect. Those are always wrong. Okay, so the number one thing is the disobedience piece. And it doesn't matter what it is. If it's, hey, Christopher, do not walk on that stage. Okay, my parents, when I was a kid, I wanted to play with guitars all the time. Parents would go, you may look at the guitar, but you may not touch the guitar. So what did I do? Staring at my parents, I went like this. And then they would, my dad always said the same thing. Oh, no, now I have to spank you. Okay? Disobedience, that's what one. It's that clear expectation, you didn't meet it, that means disobedience. Number two is dishonesty, okay? At the root of everything, this is probably like the number one thing that you have to create uh, boundaries with your kids, is dishonesty. Because if you t tell me what you're going through, we can always work through it. But that time when you tell me a lie, or you tell me what's not happening, or something that's dishonest, I can no longer deal with it. So from a young age, that was the way it was with my family. If I was dishonest about something, the punishment was catastrophic. I remember breaking my neighbor's window one time. I had a baseball, and my buddy was on the other side of the street. I was all, Brandon, go deep. Right through the window. And I was bawling my eyes out. But I ran, and I was like, Dad, I threw a baseball through the window. And he was like, oh, no, we're going to have to go apologize to them. And I was like, yeah, we are. But that was the extent of it. I had to go apologize for it. And he said, what happened? I told him I didn't know that I could throw it that far. He said, did I tell you that you couldn't play with the baseball in the front yard? I said, you've never told me that. He goes, you're right. I never told you that. But you do need to go apologize to someone else's property. So I walked over and with that. <laughs> Mr. Trenum. He was like, yes. <laughs> Sorry I broke your window. And my dad was like, thank you. And Mr. Trenum was like, it's, it's okay. I already talked to your dad. He told me that he was going to pay for it. Don't worry about it at all. We're completely square. Okay? So I went home, and then my dad said, you know what you have to do next? And I was like, what? He goes, you need to go tell your mom. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> That's even worse. So mom was already in bed, and so I had to walk into her room, just bawling my little eyes out. Mom, I broke their window. And she was like, okay. Did we tell you not to play in the front yard with the baseball? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's right, we didn't. From now on, you're too big to be playing baseball in the front yard like that. If you want to go down to the park, that's totally fine, but that's, so I got a new rule. That's my new rule. No more baseball in the front yard. Okay, so they met me with discipline, discipline. And number three is disrespect. Okay, and you guys understand disrespect. There are certain things you can do, certain things you can't do, okay? That are always right and they're always wrong. Disrespect. Okay, so clear expectations met with consistent. So what does consistent mean? Consistent means same and always. Okay, so that's what it means. So clear expectations, consistent consequences. Consistent means it's the same and it's always. 
All right. So uh, the punishment for stepping over that line in my family, it was a spanking. I never had to guess. Okay. And when I never had to guess, I never had to weigh whether or not it was acceptable to step over the line. I hated getting spanked. So I knew that if I stepped over that line, that's what it was. If you have like 19 different ways of punishing a kid, he has no way of, of governing in his own brain if it's okay or not. He can't judge that. If sometimes it's a five minute timeout and sometimes it's no more PlayStation for the next three months, it's, it creates a really confusing world for him. Okay? But if it's very consistent and it's the same and it's always, and that always thing is really important. Uh, Michael Phelps, when he finished, when he retired, he's now out of retirement, but he's that Olympic gold medalist, you know, one of the most decorated Olympians of all time. If not the, he might be the most decorated Olympian of all time. So Michael Phelps said, for every day that he doesn't spend in the pool, it takes him three days to get back to that shape. So if he skips a day, it takes him three days to be on the same time that he was at the day before he stopped. Okay, this is the same, same thing with parenting. Think about in your life. If they reiterated the same principle over and over and over again, but then they were inconsistent once, it was like, as long as I had that mark on the record, I always knew there was a chance that I'd get away with it again. Okay, so think about, it's like a six to one principle. Six times you're consistent with your punishment, six times you're consistent with your consequences, and you let it go one time, it kind of cancels it out. So it's the same and always. Okay, so the, 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 your kids always know what the punishment's going to be. And they always know that those three D's, disobedience, dishonesty, and disrespect, are going to get you that same punishment. Okay? There's a story that my dad likes to tell. Uh, my dad was brought, he was mentored by a man named Pastor Goodsman. And so, when I was a kid, I would, uh, I had a serious FOMO. Like, my parents would never have parties at my house because I would not, I wouldn't go to sleep. I would just stay up. And I was a kid, I didn't cry. I just watched people live their lives from a young age. I was the kid who never looked back. If you went to a park, I would just, and my parents could be half a mile away and I just kept on trekking. I was, I was just fascinated by people and the world. And there was like be the kids table and I never wanted to sit at the kids table, ever. Because the kids were dumb and they would throw food. And I just would sit and watch, like my aunt and my uncle talk to each other. My mom would talk to my dad and my grandpa would say some comment about the steak. My grandma would make a snide remark back. And it was just, I loved that interaction. Okay, from a young age. So, my dad invites his pastor from growing up over, and they're all downstairs, and they're having coffee and everything, and I wake up because I hear people talking. And in my home, at the ripe old age of one and a half, I didn't like that. I was like, why are people awake without me? So I came out, and my dad goes, Christopher, you're not allowed out of your bed at night. You know that that's the case. If you get out of your bed one more time, I will spank you. I got out of my bed again. I got spanked. He put me back in my bed. I got out of my bed again. I got spanked. He put me back in bed. This happened over and over and over and over again. But after four times, Pastor Goodman started laughing because <laughs> he couldn't get over it because he watched my dad grow up in his rebellious eyes. And my, he, my Pastor Goodman had my dad at camp and he knew what my dad did. And now he's laughing because he's like, this is karma because this kid did to you is doing to you what you did to me all those years, okay? But for me, it was that consistent. It was clear. It was the same, and it was always. And every time I got out of bed, I got spanked, and I would cry, and I would go back to bed, and I would come back out, okay? Now, at some point, he probably should have hit me harder or, like, locked me. I don't know what he should have done. But at the same time, it was, I never thought that I was getting out of bed without getting spanked. I weighed the consequences, and I said, I FOMO hard enough that I would rather get spanked, okay? But it was consistent. It was always. Clear expectations met with consistent consequences. Consequences. Uh, a consequence, um, this is something that happens all the time, and it's one of my pet peeves, even in, um, I do a, like a lot of babysitting or a lot of mannying or whatever it is, uh, especially before I um, left Concordia. And one of the things that was my biggest pet peeve is when you would, uh, for a consequence, you would take away something that the child doesn't deserve anyway. Does that make sense? Listen, if you do that again, no ice cream tonight. Okay, but what that teaches the kid is on nights where he doesn't do that activity, he deserves ice cream, which isn't the case. Ice cream is always a privilege. So, so to revoke a privilege that they don't, they don't deserve is kind of setting a, a false precedence of entitlement. The kid goes, so if I don't do this, I deserve ice cream. 
No, at the end of the day, it should just be a, a loving gift from a parent to child. You get ice cream because I love you. Not because you've acted good, because that's an expectation in our household. You don't get ice cream because you obey. You obey because you obey. The consequence to not obeying is punishment. But the reward for obeying is, you're my son, I love you. Now, apart from discipline and consequence, sometimes, as a gift of grace, I'm just going to give you something. Don't confuse those two, because it gets muddy then. Are we going to check each other because I'm obedient or because you love me and I'm your kid and sometimes you just like to take me to fun places? And then what about on days when I don't disobey at all? Why aren't we at Chuck E. Cheese? Okay, it's conditioning over and over and over again. So don't reward what's expected as well. Okay, if you behave in the grocery store, I will give you candy. Okay, what if the kid in the middle of the grocery store decides he doesn't want to obey? No candy? Oh, okay. And what if you take his candy away? Now what? Are you going to take my candy away twice? Okay, so the expectation is you always obey. And if I want to give you a treat, I give you a treat. But it's not consequential to the way that you act. It's because I love you and you're my kid. And don't ever, if you count to three, count to three like this, okay? This is how my parents, my parents, it, counting three was like a, it was almost like a rap that they did, okay? And here's how some people count to three, and it bugs the crap out of me. Hey, get, get out of the toilet right now. Stop playing in the toilet. Stop. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to count to three. One. Two. Get out of the toilet. Get out. You want me to get your father? Do you want me to get your father? One. Two. And all along the kid's like, do something. Go. Ooh. Okay? Here's the, the craziest thing about parenting is a kid who is well-disciplined and understands the world in which he can abide and live and what's punishable and what's not is a freer child. A rebellious kid is screaming for boundaries. Show me you love me. Make me stop. Something. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what I'm not supposed to do. I can kick this lady and sometimes you get mad and sometimes you don't. I can walk down here. All you can do is pick me up and bring me back. I don't know what you want. Okay? This is how you count to three. This is my parents count to three. Christopher, get out of the toilet. One, two, three. And if I wasn't getting out by one, I got a spanking. Okay? One, two, three was simply, I, was, I should be finished the action by three. I should be starting it by wuh. So here's the expectation. Get out of the toilet. One, two, three. And if I'm not out of the toilet by three and I haven't started by one, spanking. Because here's what happens if you don't. Hey, get out of the toilet. One, two... You learn your parents' cadence, and this is what you do. Get out of the toilet. One, two, three. I'm out. You just taught me to spend two and a half more seconds doing something I'm not supposed to be doing. And if you don't ever work and you don't have consistent consequences, I'm just never going to get out of the toilet because you're just going to keep going. You're going to go, when your dad gets up, when you do this, when you, you're like, keep going, keep counting, keep counting. I never called my mom's bluff because she never bluffed. Sometimes she hit me even when she said she wasn't going to. That really kept me on edge. Sometimes she'd walk in a room and just hit me. She'd be like, well, always be aware. No. But I remember, I remember a couple of times in my life where it was my brother's fault legitimately. Like one time he spilled the Oreos on the ground, but I, I was the only kid who really normally ate Oreos. So she walked in and spanked me. We do not have Oreos in the living room. And so I'm sitting there crying. And my brother was like. <laughs> when I finally came to, I was like. He had the Oreos. So my mom's like, okay, boom, and got him too. And I'm still crying. She's like, sometimes I mess up. And she just walked away. It's <laughs> like, fair enough, fair enough. Consequences. Lastly is discipline, discipline. What does that mean? Okay, so discipline, discipline means this. It means I discipline out of love and not out of anger. That's discipline, discipline. Okay. There's a, there's a saying that I love, and it's you can be right and wrong at the same time at the top of your voice. You can be right and wrong all at once when you're at the top of your voice. Okay? There are so many times in my life where when I look back on it, now my dad is a phenomenal dad, okay? But every dad has this time where he loses his temper. I don't remember what the lessons were when he lost his temper. I remember him losing his temper. I very rarely remember what I was being punished for. I don't. 
I remember the talk that he had with me. I remember when he reacted in anger or spanked me out of spite. Like my mom got really mad at me, and so, so ipso facto she got mad at him, and then he would take it out on me. Okay, he never like abused me or anything else like that. He was a great, he was a controlled in the way that he actually like hit, but it was like, there was a big difference between, uh-oh, guess we're gonna have to get a spanking. And I was like, no, no. And when he would walk in and go, put your hands on the bed, put them on the bed. I'm going to spank you. And then he, and it was like, that was always, it was frightening for me because I knew the power that he had. And so for me, it was always that fine line of, okay, how much of this is what I did wrong because I've done the same thing before and you weren't mad that time. So discipline, discipline is, and it's also the consequences that you do have to be reasonable. So it's not, if you leave your toys out, that is one toe. <laughs> if you leave two toys out, toys out that's two toes unreasonable okay so that's the way that it is. it's discipline discipline and here's the most discipline discipline use these two words and my dad used it all the time um, and also Andy Stanley talks about this in, in his book and also uh, he does a series called uh, future family it's really good if you guys want to listen to it um, and it's oh no my dad used to do this all the time he would get mad with me at what I did wrong not at me for what I did wrong here's what it looked like I took a little line he would go, oh, no, guess we have to spank you. Walk through it through the window. Oh, no, we better go apologize. So it was, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's biblical at its core. It says all the time, God views us as his kids. He tells us to call him father. And as father, it says that he grieves in our sin. He doesn't relish it. He doesn't go, yes, I get to punish them because they're being bad. He takes our side against sin. He has aligned himself with us against what we've done wrong. Okay, and that's what we're called to do as well. We're supposed to align ourselves with our kids against what was wrong. We don't align with the, with the sin against our kid. Going, this is what you get. This is what you deserve. This is what you've earned. Take that. And the sin's like, shouldn't have done it. Shouldn't have done it. No, we stand on this side and we go, he, it almost was like someone bigger than him made the rules and he was just following through on it. That's how it always felt to me. And that's basically what it was. Oh, man, you lied to me. Bummer. Now you got to get a spanking. No, sorry. Dang it. I really wish you hadn't lied. Oh, no. Got to get a spanking. Put your hands on the bed. And I would, I would, get, I would cry and I would get mad, but I would get mad at, the, at what I did wrong, not at him. So discipline, discipline is oh no, what you did was wrong, I'm on your side. And then it always follows up. It does it with, not out of anger, but out of love, but then it reaffirms. And here's a great way, and this isn't something that I read in a book or anything else like that, but I think it's really important. It's to re-identify who your child is. So this is what my dad used to do. He would spank me, and I would just start crying. But the first person I always turned to when I was crying was my dad who just spanked me. Because he did it almost always in discipline, in love, against my sin, alongside of me. So I would get sped. He always said, put your hands on the bed. If you move your hands, you get two. And he only said that because he used like this wooden, you know, like splash ball at the beach? That was like our paddle growing up. Anyone else have a paddle like that? Spoon. Hairbrush? The back of the hairbrush. I was like, <laughs> oh, mom, it's three inches deep this time. So don't move your hand because then you could hurt your hand really bad. So he would spank and I'd start bawling and then he would grab me and he would, it was like this bear hug. He's like, I love you, I love you, I love you. That's not who you are. It's just that redefinition of who I was. That's not who you want to be. That's not what you're about. That's not who you are. That was just a mistake that you made. That's not who you are. And I always walked away from that, getting mad at what I had done and reaffirmed in who I was. Not mad at who I was and affirmed what I had done. And that was so important in the growth that I experienced even from a young age. So I always knew at the end of the day that he was my dad and I was his kid and that he loved me and that the thing that he was doing was against his will. He didn't want to hurt me. He didn't want to punish me. But he loved me enough to know that he wants me to have a healthy adult relationships. He wants me to want to be with him. He wants me to be accountable to God and all those things play in order. But it all starts with parenting, discipline, discipline, clear expectations met with consistent consequences and disciplined discipline. 
And the way that all that stuff starts is the last thing that we're going to say is from Ephesians 6, verse 1, we hear this. And every time, almost every time in the Bible that it talks about the way that children are supposed to respond is it talks first and foremost about a husband and a wife. So some of you don't have that, that system. You might have one or the other or neither or whatever it might be. But in, in every situation, the healthiest thing that you can do for your kid is to have a healthy relationship with your spouse. Always. That is their foundation, that is their rock, that is the only relationship that they know with any consistency. The best thing that you can always do to love your kids is to love your wife. Okay? I remember from an early age, my dad would reaffirm in me, uh, Chris Brown talks about this too, a lot, but almost consistently I would be reminded that if we were on a boat and it was going down, dad was taking mom and not me. Like if this place caught on fire... If our house caught on fire and my mom couldn't walk, she was getting out of the house with my dad and we were left. And you're like, that is so sick. That is, that is sadistic. That is so weird. Why would you ever tell a kid that? But I loved it. I loved it. Because of those times then when my parents would fight, I'd always be like, he likes her more than us. I know he's going to stick with her. <laughs> the dad would go, who's my favorite? Mom is. That's right. And you're all number two. <laughs> and again, you might go, that's so, my mom always told me I was the most important thing in the world to her, and I was number one in her life. You don't want to be there. You want to push them towards that healthy relationship. And that helps you as a, as a child more. For you guys and your parenting, remember that the healthiest thing you can ever do as a parent is to be good with your spouse. Okay? So again, some of you guys are 9, 10, 15. Maybe you'll never have kids. But this gives you those words. This gives you that insight. So when you're driving down the road, just like you do now, and you're very aware of stop signs, you're very aware of speed limits. When you see someone parenting, you're going, I know where that kid reacts that way. I know why I'm the way that I am. I know where my parents did what they did. I understand why that kid never obeys his parents. It's inconsistency. It's not clear expectations. It's not discipline, discipline. It's discipline out of anger. Get that verbiage in your head so that when you, by the time you have kids, all this stuff becomes second nature to you. But again, don't get so hung up in the methodology that you forget the fact that as a living, breathing human being, and sometimes you have to tweak those things. But that sentence right there will always be the same. Clear expectations, consistent consequences, discipline, discipline. Let's pray. God, thanks for being the ultimate example of what a parent is. And this is a, it's, it's so logical and it's so tangible and, and we're even reminded in, in the book of Proverbs that you say that uh, if we discipline someone from a young age that when they get older that they will not depart from their ways. And so we just kind of assume that that title will bring with it just the, the intrinsic knowledge of how to be a parent. And yet when we look at the relationship between parents and kids and the vast majority of people, we see how broken it is. May we be lights in this next generation to parent the way that you parent us out of love with justice, but also balanced with mercy, consistency. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. May it be said of us as our kids reach 18, 19, 20, that they want to be with us, that they hold healthy adult relationships, and they're accountable to you as their Heavenly Father. And we pray. Amen.